forward, please. Dr. Daniel Bengidi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom, Boker Tov, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Today, um, this particular Torah portion that we have today, Vayera, is one of the most unusual Torah portions in the entire Bible. In fact, it's one of the most important teaching that you'll ever come across in the Bible to that extent. And why do I say that? Um, it has to do with the mere name, Lord God, and it appears in a confusing way. When you read it in English, you really cannot tell, and it, uh, it's kind of overly simplified, and the text is already pretty much chewed up for the reader. So we don't want you to do it today to consume biblical verses that are already chewed up. We'd like you to taste each one of them on your tongue and in your hearts, on your tongues and hearts. And also, you're going to be today, I'm planning that you'll be active on active duty um, working on those verses. You're not going to sit back, laid back, and I'm going to talk here, and you'll be you're just hearing. You're going to be actively uh, involved in what we do. That's why you already looked at the sheets that we have there. Uh, they are printed in a couple of colors, and those colors are very meaningful. This is something you're going to discover um, that you will not see in English. You can't. You just simply can't. And any translation will be short of carrying the complete true message of this chapter. That appears in other places too in the Bible, but here it's particularly, particularly important. Now, the, we're going to turn you, each one of you, to a kind of a biblical FBI agent, or if you're in England, as our, some of our listeners are, you're going to be biblical Scotland Yard, or if you are in Australia, you're going to be all ASIO <laughs> secret agents, biblical ASIO secret agents, and so in other countries, you know the names of your secret agents there. Now, why secret agents? Because we're going to do the work of deciphering, and as I said, you're going to experience this deciphering on your own. Well, I helped you a little bit. I put colors in certain text. Now, the first thing that you do when you do a detective work, what do you need to establish? Any detective, you know, understands that? You hear stories, you interrogate, and you investigate, and people speak. And you can't really get a picture if you just go by what people are saying. You need to use, number one, judgment, but that's not enough. Number two, you have to establish a very clear timeline. So the way we're going to read this Torah verse, uh, uh, portion, we're not going to read it in a sequence, but we're going to do stopping here, there, in order to keep the sequence of the events in order to emphasize. Then we'll go back to it and we'll read it more in a progressive way. But that's we're not going to get the whole picture if we do it only if you read it in, in the sequence, right? We're going to do st some stops and we'll jump forward. What I want to establish here, oh, something in my speaker, yeah, it's working. Uh, what I want to establish here and we have been seeing it with Pastor Mark in the Bible, Amazing Bible. And we're taking, Pastor Mark is taking an action that nobody is really there doing before. It's not just another Bible. He is daring, and I help with the Hebrew, to change words to their, the way they're supposed to be. You'll see it here very, very vividly. And you'll see one of the mistakes that is so blunt and it's so jumping to the eye, how does it reflect here in the text? You don't need to be big Hebrew scholars. You just need to be able to distinguish between red and, and blue. And <laughs> red and blue. So, um, but this will be the detective work that you'll do. And then you look at your English text. But this time you're gonna also look at the Hebrew, I'm asking that you'll also look at the Hebrew text in order to see the differences between um, the words. Now, what is this whole thing about? Um, 
it's a matter of belief. You know, people say when I first came here, America, and I do hear people say, oh, you know, uh, they speak about the Trinity or the triunity. And I said, wow, well, first I thought, and many think in Israel that that belongs to Christians only. I mean, what Trinity? We know in Israel they know only one God and there is only one and don't tell me about two or three or whatever. No, no such thing. Also, people are trying to very much dig into the secrets, so-called, and they come up with very elaborate description of what's happening in heaven. Um, it's too elaborate because many of them don't rely on facts, and the only fact when it comes to do a work like that in the Bible is what's written in the Bible. Anything else is not facts. Different kind of uh, sects or groups or congregations or community made up their own perception of the of the scriptures and some of them went really elaborate on that and far away from the text the clearer and the closer we stay to the word the better because this is really the only thing we have and this is the reason you won't find in hebrew more than one bible there is only one you can't do two Bibles. There is no such thing as a different version. People ask me, oh, what version did you use? I say, what version? The only one that there is. And why not? <laughs> you, you, get, you get a very good uh, reason for that. In the New Testament, when they asked Jesus something, Yeshua, and he said to them, not a jot and tittle can be changed from the word as long as the earth is still here. Meaning that the word, the Bible that was written there on Mount Sinai and given to Aaron and Aaron to the elders and the elders to the father until this very day is exactly the same Bible that is printed everywhere in the Jewish world. And this is the only version. So there's no two versions because you can't change even a jot and tittle. This is it. And this is what we adhere to in that book, in this Bible book that uh, Pastor Mark is editing or working on keeps it very close to the th source now some of the words here are we already it's already part and it's in the mark bits bible uh, the old testament it's coming up in a few months and uh, but some of them are not so one of them i did not even discuss with him yet because believe it or not there is so much there i just discovered it yesterday as i was talking to my daughter in israel and she brought something up which I never, ever noticed. So there are things like that in the Bible. It's right here. You will see that. And I need to discuss it with Pastor Mark when he comes back. And it's definitely going to be in his Bible. But you are going to see it this time before him. But he probably knows it. He probably knows it. But he reads it in English. And you will see an amazing difference here in front of your eyes as your detectives of the biblical FBI agents, all of you, or, you know, Scotland Yard, and you'll see it in front of your eyes very clearly, clear as a day. Let's start now with the idea. So we talk about the, the structure of what's happening in heaven. The most we can know is only from the writings, from, the, from what we read, right? The rest of them is guesswork, and we don't want to be in the area of guesswork. So... The common belief in Israel and other places that uh, there is only one God and, uh, you know, not divided and there is no such thing as Trinity or uh, anything else or two gods and so on. Trinity, or if you prefer to use the word triunity, that's fine. Uh, either way, Trinity or triunity. Um, and, and, the, and what we're going to see here today, that not only that the Trinity is not written in the Old Testament. It's actually strongly, strongly supported, and it's found right there, right there. Even in the very first, no, this is not this Torah portion, but the one that Pastor did three weeks ago, and that was the Bereshit, you know? You'll come up across the word Elohim. Bereshit bara Elohim. Now, Elohim, like in Hebrew grammar, ending with the word im, you know? So every noun in Hebrew is predetermined to be either masculine or feminine, just like in Spanish, if somebody, some of them you, you know. Um, so the, anything that ends with im in Hebrew is plural masculine noun, plural masculine noun. 
So the word Elohim by itself, it's already structured to be as a plural word, okay? So people know that and still relate to that because somebody said, well, it's a one. Well, one, but the Hebrew grammar does not lie. When it ends with im, it means plural already. But it gets so common, and in Israel you don't even think about it anymore in other places in the Jew- across the Jewish world, and they look at it as singular. But we're going to show here it's not so singular, even in sentences that disclose more than just the name itself. All right. What we do here, so every time you see red text, that refers to plural. Red text in large, I enlarge it here. It's plural. When you see blue, blue text or blue names or words, they're going to be singular, okay? And this is what it is. In Hebrew, when you read Hebrew, you know. You can say in English, for instance, a friend called me yesterday. That's meaningless. You know, a friend called me yesterday. What friend? Was that a guy? Was that a woman? The word friend cannot work like this in Hebrew. You... By saying the word friend in Hebrew, you're already disclosing the gender. Haver will be a friend male, and Havera will be a female friend. So if you say the sentence, a friend called me, I spoke to my friend, you're already disclosing more information that you can get in English. Also, you say the word you in English. It's a very confusing word, you. You know, it's to say, I like you, is not the same as, um, um, well, I don't want to get into too much grammar here, but there are, you can say it as an object, or, you know, you can, you can use it as an object or as a subject, you know, I like you, you're there, and so on. But let's not get into this at this point, uh, but there are more distinctive ways to say, there are four U's in Hebrew and each one is different. There is you, you know, what's the difference between, say, you guys, or you lady, or you guy. No difference. It's the same you, right? So if I said the word, you're very good, who do I talk to? The person I'm looking at exactly, or to all of you, or to a guy, or to a girl. So there are four yous in Hebrew. There is ata, and this is the way to say you to a person, to a guy. At is you to say to a woman. Atem will be you guys, in plural, in, in, in plural, inclusive, including guys and girls, men and, men and women. And the word you, in particular, aten, it will be only when you're addressing women. So atem will be addressing men and women together, or just men. But when you say aten, it will be you when addressing women only. So that's what I mean. I got into the grammar. I plan not to do that, but I got into this. So, so there are four you in Hebrew. At, ata, at, atem, aten. You don't have it in English. So English is really falling short in um, communication, basically. Falling short in communication. And this is not the only way it's falling short in communication. But think of that as a super, Hebrew is much superior in precision because this is a language of God and angels, and it has to be precise if you want to carry the world, with the word, which is the plan of God to the world. You can't be vague, you can't speak and slutter and kind of, you know, it has to be very precise, and that's what it is. And this is what you're going to do now, detecting the precision of the Hebrew language, and you're going by two colors. So prepare, dear agents here, uh, the job. Let's start with the very beginning in this Torah portion, right? Amen. So you see here in verse 1, it's in blue. And it says, Vayera, which is the name of the Torah portion today. Vayera elav Adonai. The yud hey vav hey, we read it as Adonai. Even though we don't pronounce it, we explained it in the past, why we don't do that. And if you still don't know why we don't do that, um, Jews don't do that. It's because uh, oh, that's a, that's a subject on its own. Well, I, I should mention that um, the reason for that <laughs> there are many names for God. You know, Elohim, Adonai, and and so even Adonai. The word Adonai is we, when we see those four characters, the, the tetragrammaton, 
the Yud Hey Vav Hey, it's translated simply in English as Lord, um, we are saying Adonai. We're not reading it as it's written. And uh, one of the reasons for that is the, you know, there are 10 commandments out of 613 commandments. 10 of them made it to the top chart. And one of them is this. You should not, in English, you should not take my name in vain. In Hebrew, you should not lift up my name in vain. Lo tisa. The word is tisa. So Hebrew says, do not lift up my name in vain. Even that sentence, look at the, look at the precision. It indicates when somebody utters the name of God, what's the direction? Because it says, you should not lift up my name in vain. In vain. So it indicates where God is. You don't speak it down or sideways, but you speak it upwards by same thing with the word prayer, by the way. You don't say a pray in a prayer in Hebrew. In Hebrew is tisa tfila, lift up a prayer. Also showing the direction where prayer is supposed to go. You don't pray pray down or sideways or any other direction or backwards, you know. You in the moment you emit a pray, a prayer. It has a direction in Hebrew. It's lifting up. It's going upwards. This is where it's supposed to go. Just showing you some amazing examples of the tongue, of the Hebrew tongue. The word itself, you cannot say, say a little prayer for me. It doesn't work. You don't say a prayer. You are lifting up a prayer by structure of the language, right? So the name, the Yud Hevav He, is the tetragrammaton. And one of the ten, the important one, says, you should not lift up my name in vain. Since nobody knows what exactly in vain means, you know, it's open to interpretation. One person is praying for, you know, for the healing of somebody, and then you would say, it's not, that's not in vain, right? And if somebody else is praying for success of his, I don't know, his son in a medical school, you would say, it's not in vain. It's important. You'll save people. And somebody else praying for the success of his daughter in law school. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, you can think about it. It's a, you know, but if somebody's praying for two Bentleys and one Mercedes, one green and the other one, in, you know, for each even and uneven days of the week to drive home and to stores and praying for that, you will say, hmm, that might be kind of in vain. And using the name of God. So we don't know the borderline between in vain and not in vain. Therefore, uh, they take the they take the the stance which is called humra, severity. There are two ways to look at the law, at the law or the, the request of God. The law is not something negative, basically. I mean the law. What what God is requesting, two ways to look at it. One in a severe way, like to the word, right? to the word, right to the word, to the small print, or in the light way, no big deal, ah, bah, you know, no big deal. But the approach is the severe, you know, so they take the one. So even if there is 1% of chance to transgress against the request, which not left up my name in vain, better not to take the chance of 1% and not say it at all. That's the idea. Because we don't know for sure what's in vain means. And you know what? Surprisingly, this is the approach that Yeshua himself takes. You can see it in the New Testament. You know about coveting a, wife, a woman. Even if you look, it's already committing. You know, And in other places too, you can see that his approach is of humra, means severity, the severe way of interpreting the law or the request. Okay? So that's why people don't say this name. Do, do you see that? And you say, Adonai. Vayera alav Adonai. So, and the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now, that verse is used as a foreshadowing. Like any kind of drama or story, it, it foreshadows what comes after. What is it telling us? That Abraham saw, not in a dream and not in a vision, in real life, he saw God himself, the creator. This is what it says. The yud heh vav -Hey, that's how we spell the name of the creator, okay? So we got here the foreshadowing that on that day, uh, the God himself revealed to him in the flesh, 
um, when he was sitting at the opening of the tent. Now we are flipping, and this is a lot of flips between red and blue, and it's really not clear and why. Okay, look, look here. In verse 2, he lift up, and I'm reading from the Hebrew, I do in quick, impromptu translation, so you read the English if you like. And he lift up his eyes and looked, Vaisa, you see, that's the word. Yisa, same word as to lift up a prayer or to lift up God's name. You know, Yisa, that's the word in Hebrew, Yisa, the first word in Hebrew. You don't read it yet, I know, but that's the word that for using to lift up a prayer or to, um, um, instead of saying a prayer or saying the name of God. So he lift up his eyes. Yeah, here, and he lifted up his eyes. And behold, or lo, three men, men, right? M-E-N, three men stood by him. But you know, the foreshadowing said that he already he saw God, the Father, the Creator on that day. But he sees here three men stood by him. The word stood by him is kind of a weaker expression in English. In Hebrew, nitzavim alav means poised upon him. Like you can picture that. He's, they're sitting there and they are not stood by him, you know, like buddy, but no, they, they poised upon him, over him. Get the idea this, who these men are. Um, so three men poised upon him, and that's why we put it in red. Vayarot slikatam, and he ran towards them, right? English is okay here, right? And let's check the English because I'm looking at the Hebrew. Um, when he saw them, yeah, the word them, he ran to meet them, them, them. So we're talking about plural here, right? Simple, and that's why it's red. And he bowed down to the ground. And look what he's saying here. And look at the flip in verse 3. Okay? Dear agents, look what's happening here. And he said, my Lord, but the word Adonai by Hebrew, by the structure of Hebrew, means lords. It's plural. Adonai is a plural word. Adonai, my plural. It's the plural. Just the word Adonim are gods or lords. And say, I, everything that ends with I becomes my. Okay? Just like in English. My, I, you know, Yad is a hand, yadai, my hands, yadai will be my hands, oznai will be my ears, um, yeladai will be my children, I ending is plural, possession, my. So you say Adonai, and it's spelled also, look at the spelling under the third letter from the right, it's like a little T, and that, sound, that sounds A in Hebrew, to make it, so N and A makes it Na, so it's Adonai, if I found favor or grace in your eye, ah, but suddenly in your eyes become singular. So he's saying, Adonai, lords, right? He said, my lords, because he's talking to three. There are three people, there are three men there. So why is he talking only to one? You notice what's happening here? There are three men poised upon him. And he says, in the first word, he says, Adonai. My lords, right? In plural, in capital L, supposed to be. And then he flips and says, I found favor in your eye. But the your here is in singular. Be'enecha. This is how you talk to one person. Be'enecha. Al avor. That's the next word in Hebrew, the middle one. Pass through. Pass, no, you know? But it's also to a singular, to one person. For plural, it should be ta'avoru, ta'avoru, all the u ending in verbs in Hebrew, so plural. And ta'avor means you, guy, a person, not guy, I'm using the word guy, but it's for masculine, right? Do not pass from over your slave. The word your here in Hebrew, or your servant, the your is yours addressing a singular. So there are three, and he talks to one. Okay. Now, if, look at how he flips again. So here he talks to, he clearly he speaks to one of the three. The first one is Adonai, but then he talks to uh, singular. 
But in verse 4, it says, uh, Let a little water, I beseech you. Now, who is the you? There is no you here in the Hebrew. It says, let some water be taken. And then it says, I mean, the English added, I beseech you. There's no beseech you in Hebrew. And it says, And you, plural, wash your feet. Your feet, but it's plural, rachatsu. Every time u in the end is when you talk to plural, to more than one. Rachatsu, ragle chem, chem, final mem, means your feet in plural, not your foot, your feet to one person, your feet to the three. Vehisha anu, and rest yourself. Okay, and lean in Hebrew, rest yourself under the tree. Right. So he's talking to the three here, right? In this, it's all in, in red. So first he said, in your eyes, talking to a singular, and suddenly he flips here and he talks to plural. And he says, and lean out in the tree. And he continues in verse five, and he says, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and you comfort your hearts, and it's red. You see, he's talking to the three. Continues to talking to the three. Comfort your hearts. Otherwise, it will be your heart, right? To a person, one person. Two hearts, plural. After that, you should pass on. Seeing that you are come to your servant. And they said, they, they, they. We know it's plural, right? Because it says they in English. And they said, so do. Okay. As you have said, they speak to Abraham. Clearly not an argument here about the identity. There are three people talking to him at the same time, right? And they said, now we're making a small skip here, but we're cutting the, uh, the progression. So we, we want to adhere to a timeline of the story. So we'll stop it here for a second. Just go to verse 8 in the bottom. And um, see, that is a side story. In, in verse 8, it says, And he took butter and milk and, this, and the young and a calf, I mean, and a veal, right? That he made and put in front of them, and he's standing under the tree, and they ate. This is another problem, a big-time problem to the Jewish uh, dietary law. So, you know, in Israel, the dietary law says that you cannot eat meat and milk. And this whole thing is based on this verse here. Not, not on here, in other places where it says you shouldn't, but only, it, never, it doesn't say ever in the Bible that you should not. There is not one law or request or demand upon God, from God to say to people, do not eat meat and milk. Not even one time in the Bible it appears. No. So why people do that? Why they are so afraid to have anything, you know, meat and milk, you know, in, in Jewish? Um, all it says there in the Bible three times or twice, I can't remember exactly. It says you should not cook the kid in the milk of its mother. Big difference between you should not cook the kid in the milk of its mother from don't eat meat and milk. I mean... What's the story? If God doesn't want people to eat meat and milk, he can simply say, hey, you know, you guys, I don't want you to eat meat and milk. Avoid that. Refrain from that. No. No, he doesn't say that. All it says there, do not cook the kid in the milk of his mother. What's the problem with God here? You know why so many Jews are following that rule in such a distorted understanding? I mean, what's the problem? Is God short of vocabulary? Or what? Or Hebrew, his Hebrew is not so good. He said, do not kick the milk, and then, you know, he needs to take some lessons. Or what's the story? Or he was kidding, you know, kidding, kid, right? Or, you know, got confused that moment. What? You can't find an explanation to this distortion, you know? If he wanted to say that, he could say it in clear words. In clear words. Hey, don't eat meat and milk. No, don't cook, cook you know. Assumption is that Canaanite or the neighbors of the Jews at the time had a custom where they accumulated, gathered milk of goats for 30 days during a feast. 
And on that day of their holiday, they threw a baby lamb, a baby kid, into a boiling milk of their mothers. And that's, it's a very terrible habit. And they lived nearby the Israelites. And the idea is that probably God will say to them, hey, don't do what they do. That's it. It's immoral. Don't do that. But from that they understood you should not eat meat and milk, you know. And now they made it like a rule from God, which really isn't. But here what happens. Look at it in this verse. Verse 8 says, so Abraham is trying to be very, is a husband. You know, show him his great hospitality. And look, he takes butter and milk and the veal. I mean, can't be more explicit than that, right? I mean, people can see that and scream, oh my goodness, what is he doing? And it's not to another person, but to God himself that he saw. And to others, mysterious accompanying entities that came with God. We don't know yet who they are, right? But two others with him, and he's serving them milk, I mean, butter, milk, and meat together. So if, this, if the verse ended here, and somebody wants to continue it from his imagination or her, and they would say, oh, and they took it and threw it to the ground and stepped on it, and they were puking and left away, very angry, the scene. But luckily, it did not end there. So he did that, and he's standing, again, standing upon them, over them. You know, they are sitting and eating under the tree. And then it says, Vayochelu, and they ate. So if God asks people, oh, don't do that, and he eats that, he and the two others with him, I would say, good enough for God, good enough for people, you know. So they ate. So they had no problem eating meat, milk, and butter, you know. Okay, so that's my little personal criticism on um, kind of teaching that comes, you know, and they throw it on your heads without giving you an option even to think. We're skipping here some verses because we want to continue the timeline, and then we'll go back there, and we go right to verse 20, okay? Flip a page. And you, you all see, we're continuing with our detective work here, and you're paying attention to the Hebrew so you can see what happens. So just by looking at verse 20, is that, let me ask you, um, who is speaking here, singular or plural? Color, come on. Singular, right? It's blue, right? Singular. And in English also, the English kept it correctly, and the English says, and the Lord said, in singular, right? Evayomer Adonai, the Yud Hei the Lord said, because the cry of Sedom and Gomorrah in Hebrew, Sedom and Amorah, is so great and their sin is so severe, oh, very grave. Look, and this is the Lord, one, but there are three there still with Abraham, right? At their meal. But the Lord, one of the three, saying this, and verse 21, who is still speaking there by the color only? Same one, the singular, God, right? And he says, I will go down now. Why go down? Because they are in higher ground. And Sedom and Gomorrah are in the valley there of the Jordan Valley, right? The Dead Sea area, which is really the deepest place on earth, by the way. It is the lowest place on earth. So I'll go down. So geographically, it's correct, you know. And that shows, again, it's physical. I'll go down there. If that was a mountain, you would say, I'll climb up there or go up. But I'll go down. And it's still physical God. And he says, I'll go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry. Meaning, I'm going to check out. I, I get some rumors and messages here that they are doing, these people are very bad but I'm going to do personally, I'm going to go down there and check it. Which has come to me, and you know, message it. And, and if not, I'll know. Okay, check finding. You know, you get notes. He doesn't want to respond yet. I'm going to check it personally, what's happening there. So this is God speaking, entity, right? He is speaking. He said, I'll go down and check it. 
But look what happens in the next verse. You already see the conflict. Your eyes, your detecting eyes are seeing the shift between God, blue, blue, to suddenly the plural. So he said, I will go down there. But what happens here in 22? And the men turned their faces from there. In Hebrew, simply means departed. They turned their faces, you know. That's what happens when you go to a direction. You need to look where you're going, right? So they uh, turned their faces. Simply turned, you know, from there. And went towards Sedom. But this is the man. But look what happened. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. So, oh, wait. So not all of them did, right? The men, they say men, they didn't put the number. The men turned and they went towards Sedom. But Abraham is still standing before the Lord. So how many people, by simple math, how many people left there to Sedom? Two, right? Two. Because one still stayed there, and that's the God. That's the, that's the Lord himself. And Abraham still stood before him. Picture that. He is a simple, is a man, and he's standing before God. Wow. And he's getting, he's getting very, very fresh in his attitude to God. Very arrogant. I mean, speaking in polite way, but he's bargaining with him. But we read one more verse, and then we'll skip again to keep the timeline. In verse 23, Abraham, look, and it, again, another proof, it's not a vision, and it's not a dream. Why? How do we know? And Abraham drew near. You don't, do, you don't need to draw near in a vision, right? In a, in a dream. He drew near because that was the f- God in a physical manifestation in front of him. And said, will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Woo! What's happening here? Is the men challenging God, righteousness? They say, are you going to do that? God said, I'm going to destroy. Okay, we're skipping here to continue the timeline because we need to do more detecting work here, right? Otherwise, we'll get too much information that will kind of clutter and will kind of cause some kind of vague understanding of the event. So we'll skip to the next couple of pages. Go to verse, to Genesis 19, verse 1. Genesis 19, verse 1. Just looking quickly with your eyes, who are, who are the people involved here? Plural, right? It's red, right? And indeed, but here you will have some problems with the English. And there came two, now they call them angels. But just a minute, you know, the verses before, they were called men. Now the Bible is giving them the title of angels, right? And the two angels, and let's look here. Okay, they comes to Sedom, right? Sedoma. And Lot is sitting in the gate of the, of the city. And he see them, Vayar, Vayar. He saw them, and he stood up towards them, right? And the English is okay. It, it's towards them. And he bowed himself with his face to the ground, so this is just, he doesn't know who they are. The narrative telling us they're angels, but Lot doesn't know. He sees two men, right? Two men kind of uh, coming to the city, which normally at that time, not too many 7-Elevens on the way. When you go, you turn, you, people can be very hungry, you know, and uh, they need treatment and they are, you need to wash and so on. So this is part of the ancient hospitality that Abraham was famous for and the Jewish people and also the tribes there in the whole Middle East are very known for their uh, hospitality. So he get up towards them and he bows down. And now look what he's saying. Vayomer hinena Adonai. But this Adonai has a different vowel under the noon. It's just one straight line, not the little T that you saw before. That will mean in Hebrew, gentlemen, you know. And indeed, the English understands it. Look what the English says. And he said, behold now, my lords, in a lower case, right? Which like, basically, it's you guys. Hey, you guys, or gentlemen, or whatever you want, lords, you know. 
polite, but he doesn't know who they are clearly, right? But it's plural. And that word, Adonai, because it's spelled a little differently, it means guys, basically, you know, lords in lower case. Turn in, I beseech you, okay, to your servant's house and remain all night. And, you know, that's great hospitality. And wash your feet and, you, and then you will wake up, you, plural, all of them. Look at that, every word there, every word. Look for the first, uh, one, two, three. The third word ending with the mem. You see, this is the final mem. It's like a block, you see, like a box. And then next one, not. And then look at the, th- the last word on that verse, on uh, verse two. In the end, that's letter. Raglechem, and ishkamtem, vehalachtem, ledarkechem. Everything ending with that, that's the indicator of plural masculine. And they said, no, 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 we're going to sleep on the street. Okay, we're skipping now again here. And from here we go. From here we're going. Okay, notice that the, the title degrades with the two men, when the two men continue. First, first there were men, right? Then lords with the uppercase, right? That we read before, lords with the uppercase. Then angels. Now they are called just my lords in the lower case. Changing attitude and changing degradation of their... Although the, the name here is Adonai. Uh, it is written with the vowel point used to address ordinary people. This story, though, though does not uh, end here. Okay. So later, the two men, lords, angels, um, the two men, <laughs> dash, lords, dash, angels, dash, lord, in the lower case, perform supernatural acts by blinding the evil residents of Sedom who were trying to attack them. And God, Lord... Uh, to attend them by uh, uh, and disclose to him their mission. Now, well, we see that later, okay? Um, well, let's do it here. Let's do it here. Let's go to verse um, 13, okay? Couple of pages. So they are telling him at this point, well, they're going to some very ugly situation when the, the people of the city want to rape them, basically. They are asking Lot, hey, get them out from the house. We want to rape them. And Lot, as a, showing an extreme degree of hospitality, we're skipping those verses now, we'll go back to them later, uh, says to them, no, no, you're not going to touch them. Take my daughters and do with them whatever you want, but don't touch these men. So he doesn't do that because he knows they are divine. He just, it's protecting your guests more than your own family. That's the idea. And, uh, and then the two men in his house, angels or whatever they are, they are causing the people their blindness and they don't, cannot find the door. And here comes in verse 20, 13, they are disclosing their mission. And what do they say? For we will destroy this place because their cry has grown great before the face of the Lord. Oops. So they are telling them the mission. And they confirm the story that we heard before, that God, the father, says to Abraham, I heard it's very bad, and I'm planning to destroy the city, and so on. And they are saying, well, we are in the mission right now here, because the outcry came before the the face of the Lord. Okay, so they talk about the Lord that that stayed there with Abraham, right? And the Lord has sent us, pay attention to this verse, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now, Lord is sending messengers and others to missions, important missions on earth. We'll meet another one soon that is also sent to earth. But look at it. It's a mission. Lord has sent us, right, to destroy it. Now, we'll skip here to stay with the timeline and go to verse 18. And now look, well, if you have English books here, the green that you see in 18, it's already a change for the Marx Built Bible. It's not in the King James. 
What did the King James say there? Somebody has the King James here quickly to look or any other Bible? Look it up. Look it up. You are agents today. You are doing some, de- some detecting work. Look at the English. What does the English say? Not in this print, but in your Bibles. If somebody has a Bible on the phone. Freddy, what do you see? Go ahead. Take your time. Find it. Anybody else found it already? Take, take a minute. Take a minute. It's important. Yep. Yeah. Oops, say it again out loud. Hold on. You, you want to come here? Come over here. Yep. And go ahead. Read that line from the, from the Bible, your Bible. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Said to them? And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. What kind of English is that? Said to them, not so, my Lord. Where, what's the problem here? Said to them should be my Lord's, right? Or something else. Not said to them, not so, my Lord. Are you talking to one or to plural? But the word in Hebrew here is Adonai. If you, some of you recognize that in verse 18. Adonai with the vowel that is used to talk to God, my lords. And that's why we put the lords here. He's talking to plural, and he already knows and understands who is he talking to. That's why he says, to them, my lords. And that's why you put the word lords, because he, they're plural, right? He cannot say, my lord. They're not one, they're two. And he knows who they are at that point, because they already did a miracle. They told him the mission, and he called them also by the name God. You know, gods or lords. And then, verse 19, it flips again. It's blue. So he says, and he talks to, like, to a singular, if your servant, and the word is in green, I mean in blue, because that's how he speaks like to a singular person. If your servant found grace in your sight and you have magnified your mercy, which you have shown to me in saving my life, I cannot escape to the, mount- to the mountain, right? I-, I-, I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I will die, okay? So he's speaking to the two of them, and, and, and yet he talks to one. He speaks in singular language. So verse 20 says, and here this city is very close, um, nearby to flee. Okay. And then he continues in verse 21, and he says, and it says, and he said to, the, said to him. What is the he said to him? Who is the he? God, right? One of one of the two, right? Because it's like before that he said, "Oh, here's the here's the city. Behold, now in verse twenty, behold, now the city is near to flee to, and it is a little a little one. Oh, let me escape there. Um, is it not a little one? And my soul should live. Okay, mitzar, but you okay." So he's getting an answer, and the answer is one of them, right? Vayomer elav, and he, so we put he because that's like not translated in English properly. I don't know what your English says. Said to him, because I put it in green, so I don't know what the English says there, but it needed the green. That's the Mark Wheels Bible. Uh, said to him, I have escaped, I have accepted your concerning, but in Hebrew it means I favored you, accepted your face, accept accepted you concerning this thing also. Cumbersome language, you know. I, I found, I, I favored you. You know, I'm on your side. Uh, also for this, I'll accept what you're saying here. Not to turn away or what, to overthrow this city. So one of them said, okay, Lot, you want to go there? That's fine. I'm not going to destroy that place, place as you speak. And he said, hurry. In 22, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything till you come there, right? So that's the one who is 
sent by God to execute the idea of destroying the city. So go there, and because I will not be able to do anything until you get there, right? So he changes the name of the city to Tzoar, from the word Mitzar. From, it's the, the Hebrew Mitzar is like small. It says it's small. Okay, let's go to the next page. And here is a verse that my daughter found in the Bible yesterday. And she just, like, you know, she texted to me and I'm looking and said, I can't believe that. Look at the next page, right? There's no page number on that one, right? When it says excerpt from Genesis 35, okay? You see that, that the next page of, the, right? Everybody found it? Okay, Vayakov, this is about Jacob. That's years after, that's much after. So, but look, it's very important. And Jacob came to Luz, okay? And Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. That is Bethel. And he, uh, Bethel, he and all the people who were with him. Fine, but look at the next verse, seven. There are only two verses from that, from this chapter 35. And he built there an altar and called the place Bethel. No, he called the place El Bethel. El Bethel, God, house of God. God, house of God. Because their God appeared to him. Stop. We haven't changed it in the Mark Beats Bible yet. It's not God appeared to him. But look at the blue, I mean the red. God's appear to him. Niglu is plural, and that's one strong, very strong, very, very unusual disclosure of God in the New Testament as more than one. Very, very sharp. Niglu elav ha-Elohim, the Lord's in low, in uppercase revealed to him where, while he was escaping from his brothers. So you don't see it in the English yet because we have not corrected it for the Mark Bilt's Bible, but it will be corrected because the Hebrew speaks plural here, which is very, very unusual. Just the word Elohim appears many times, but a verb with it that is in plural, one time. I didn't see any other place than this that it comes like that. You know, the verb is in plural, niglu. If that was the one, it would be nigla. Nigla and not niglu. The u in the end, you know, um, like hallelujah, you know, and so on. The u in the end, um, like in hallelujah. Uh, baruchu, darchu, all that, the u in the end indicates talking to plural, about plural. So the gods, or the, I don't want to say gods, it sounds strange, but the lords, that sounds strange too, right? Uh, but the lords revealed themselves themselves to him. Wow. You know, more than one. And if you even more, if you, if you need even more explicit evidence regarding the Holy Trinity or Triunity, read the dramatic prophecy of Isaiah. The following verse clearly declares the Trinity or Triunity. Um, reminding those who may have forgotten, the book of Isaiah is part of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. It's not the New Testament. People think it's like, you know, it. oh, that's... No, it's part of the Old Testament, right? Book of Isaiah. And look what it says there. Kirvu elai, come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret. From the beginning, right? From the beginning, from the time that it was. Okay? So, I was there. I was There am I. So, I was there from the beginning, right? And the important part, the very important part. So, remember, the, whomever speaks there says, I was there from the beginning. And it says, and now... I was there, there was I from the beginning of time, right? And now the Lord God, to make sure we're talking about the yud Hey vav Hey, speaks in Hebrew there, and his spirit has sent me. So there are three entities here, right? The one that is speaking, that was there from the beginning, and the Lord God, 
the Father, the Creator, and His Spirit sent me. And you saw the sent me before, the two speaking about sent me. Who sent them? The Lord God has sent them. And here is now, <laughs> who then is speaking here? You don't need to make much more guesses. Who else was there from the beginning? Who else was sent to earth by the Lord God and his spirit? And this is Old Testament. Yes, you sure, right? Um, and yes, a simple count shows the truth. Divinity is indeed three. The Lord God, Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son, right? So who can still claim that the Holy Trinity or Triunity is revealed only in the New Testament? All right. It's like, I think our time is it's the break time. We'll continue with the rest of it in the second session, just a little bit, and we'll do some Hebrew too in the second part, like Hebrew conversation, lighting up. So take a little break. It was like a little heavy here, um, and we'll continue. That's the time, right? Okay. Thank you. We are continuing now, but now you're reading it in a flowing way. I mean, continue with this Torah portion because it's really long. It's a very long one, and it's very significant. Besides what we did now, there is something very important too, and that's the coming up in the uh, next couple of chapters. So let's go back to the beginning, to the um, Genesis 18, um, verse 1 to, we read verse 1 to 5 very clearly. And um, we did also up to verse 8, right? <clears throat> we skipped a couple of verses there, but we know what they are. So he makes a, uh, it's to get the, the Abraham serve the three men at the time. Uh, he serves them with uh, me, uh, butter, milk, and meat. And then we go to the next verse, right? And now the three are asking Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? And they're asking him, so look, the communication is with the husband. Okay? But it goes on after that. And say, where is your wife? And he said, she's in the tent, and I'm doing impromptu translation from the Hebrew. And then he said, he, suddenly it's he. First, even here in nine, look at that. And they said to him, where is your Sarah, your wife? And, he, and Abraham answered, and he said, once again, there is he. One of them is speaking. You see that? How it flips again, even here. And he said, I will certainly return to you at the appointed time. Now, Pastor Mark is teaching a lot about the appointed time. I don't know what the English says there. It says something else because the green is typical to what we do in, in the Mark Beats Bible, you know, in the phonetic audio Mark Beats Bible. So appointed time is probably another word there in the in the English. Um, can you see? No, it's appointed time. Et chaya, appointed time. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Right? She heard. And telling us that Abraham and Sarah, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well advanced in age. And it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, right? Women. Um, and Sarah, but, <clears throat> and Sarah, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. So she did not laugh out loud that anybody can hear. It was in her heart. She was laughing. She was like, hmm. Saying, Saying, but not saying out loud, she is saying it to herself because she was laughing and said, saying, After I'm grown old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. So it's not pleasure in Hebrew. Edna means rejuvenation. It's kind of a rejuvenation. They put it as pleasure, but it's okay. They they went very practical here, you know. Um, 13 says, in 13, and God said to Abraham, So he talks to Abraham. He didn't ask Sarah. He talks to, you see some kind of an honor, ownership here? He talks to Abraham and he says to him, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? But she didn't say it. It was in her inside. And he, God 
detected it. He knew that, right? And God is challenging in Abraham. Say, is it too? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Um, and again, at the appointed time, you know, at the time appointed, I will return to you at this designated time, and Sarah shall have a son. Okay, and Sarah denied. Okay, now she is thinking, well, I can, I mean, she must have been surprised. How did he know? Because she didn't say anything. It is inside her. So why, how did she even dare denying it, you know? Couldn't she tell that he knows already? God knows. Okay. So maybe she doesn't know who he is, right? She's thinking, a person, well, maybe he had a guest, you know? But, and Sarah denying, denied, saying, I left not. For she was afraid. And he said, no, you did laugh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you did laugh. Okay, but no punishment, just like, don't play with me. I mean, I know exactly what happened here. And the man rose, the men, you see, they are still talking about men. The he is one of the three. That's the father, God, right? And the men rose from there and looked toward Sedom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way, just escorting them to their way out, like somebody visits you, and you say, okay, yeah, you go with them outside. So my mother used to say on that, you know, when guests came, she walked out of them, out of the house, and said, oh, you don't need to walk us, it's cold outside. I said, no, no, I'm just trying to make sure that you're really leaving. <laughs> <laughs> So, and now God says to Abraham, so look at this special treatment. He said, like, like almost like in an apologetic way, he said, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Actually, it says, do I, not shall, you know, do I, do I, do I have anything to hide from you? No, everything, I mean, like, what, does he owe Abraham anything? But look at that. It's almost like an apology here. Do I hide anything from Abraham, what I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. Okay. Um, for I know him. Okay. So he will command his sons and his house after him, and they, and they kept the way of the Lord, the yud heh vav -Hey here, you see? So they're admitting who he is, to do righteousness and justice in, in order to bring God to Abraham, to bring God, in order to bring upon Abraham that uh, which he has spoken to him. And then the rest we did up to 23, and in 24 starts the bargaining thing, you know? Well, when you do that, are you going to kill, destroy the whole city? There are 50 righteous there. And look at this daring speech of Abraham to say, you know, uh, be it far from you. Like, who talks like that? It's not your level to do that, you know. Look, he there speaking to God like a person speak to a child, you know, or somebody that he semi-respect. Well, it's not... It's not really. It's too much what you're doing. Huh? What do you, don't you think so? It, there is something condescending in his speech here, you know? Be it far from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. I mean, he, God's need to hear from Abraham morals. You know, he's teaching Abraham. Abraham is teaching him morals. You know, that's very strange. Um, and then God says, well, Look how he, he kind of follows us, Abraham said. Well, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous in the city, and I will forgive the whole city for them, you know, and I will then do what? I will then spare the whole place for their sake. So Abraham now reminding God, well, I'm nobody, you know, just like he said. Um, and Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord, I, uh, I who am but dust and ashes. So he does make himself small again in the eyes of the Lord. Say, I'm nobody, you know, but. And then the bargaining continues in a very fierce way. 
But if the 50 will, it will be short in like five, are you going to destroy the city for, you know, I mean, if they're short five? And God says, no, no, I will not destroy if I find their 45. And he continues to say, well, what about if they were finding 40? And do we do that for 40? And God says, <laughs> and God says no, I'm not going to do it. If I find 40 righteous men in that city, I'm not going to destroy it. And he said, well, don't be angry. That's what he says in, in verse 30. And he said to him, oh, let not the Lord be... <laughs> yeah, that's what he translates. Let, no, don't, don't be mad, but uh, I'll speak here. And, but if you find 30, and he said, well, if I find 30, I'm not going to do it. And in 31, well, look at this very polite way. He, he uses this one verse is polite. The other one is a little arrogant, you know? I mean, what, bargaining. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord. Perhaps there shall be 20 found there, 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy for 20. <laughs> and then he goes again and he said, Well, and he said, Oh, let not be the Lord be angry and I'll speak yet. But this one, possibly 10 shall be found there. And he said, I'll not destroy it for the sake of 10, for the 10th sake. Okay, so they stop at 10, right, at this point. Look what happens. But remember the two angel or the two men, angel, whatever you want to call them, already departed much before, right? And, um, and now God, and when he, as he sees, as he stopped talking to, what did he say, and the Lord, as soon as he had left talking, left talking with Abraham, after, after he's done this conversation about would you do that, or the bargaining, he left, and Abraham returned to his place, okay? Now, you read in 19 that the two angels came, and they went to Sto Sedom, and they said, no, we're going to sleep in the street, and he asked them, uh, come to my house. We're skipping some verses here, because we already discussed them. He offers his daughters to the people of the city instead of risking the uh, guests, you know, people that he's um, hosting. And um, and they admit in, in verse 13 that we are here to destroy this place because God has sent us to destroy it. So they, dis they disclose the mission. Why are they there? God disclosed. We are destroying two people with nothing in their hands, no arms. They are coming to destroy and he understands from this point that these are more than ordinary people. He, you know, God sent them to destroy. Okay, and in 14, and Lot came out to and spoke to his uh, sons-in-law. Uh, look, and there is sons-in-law. Who are the sons-in-law? Those who marry daughters, right? So they make it more explicit to the sons-in-law who had married his daughters. Obviously, right? And said, right, obviously, the sons-in-law marrying the daughters, right? Not his sons, okay? And uh, arise, go out from the place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But, but to his sons-in-law, it seemed that he was joking. Uchmoshachra and at dawn, at dawn, the angels tried to make Lot hurry, saying to him, Arise, take your wife and your daughter and your two daughters who are here. But what about the sons in law in that case? T two daughters, lest you will be swept away, 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 twice. Um, swept away, away in the iniquity of the city. Okay. And he lingers on, right? Behold, he, he lingered, but he lingers on. And um, and the man laid hold upon his hand, and upon the head hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. But we don't hear about the sons-in-law anymore, right? Those who married his daughters, right? Okay, and uh, and it came to pass. When they had brought them outside, what's the big sin of those sons of law that they left and they didn't believe? That's not a big sin, right? They didn't believe, but they look at the punishment. They're not coming to be rescued, right? In that point. Okay. 
And it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Um, look, not by, look, not, look not behind you, nor stay at the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you, are, you, lest you be consumed. And then he says to them, we read it before in this whole thing, um, and he says, oh, please don't do that. We're going to the Mitzar, to the small place there. And they say, oh, all right, even as you go there, will I will. It's singular. All that is in blue, right? As we talked before, it's all blue. God speaks to him and said, all right, I'm not going to turn. I'm not going to destroy that city. And then the, we had the excerpt from uh, um, Genesis 35, when God comes in plural, clearly in the Bible, and the excerpt for the uh, book of Isaiah. And we're continuing now with Genesis 19. In Genesis 19, the sun was risen upon the earth, and Lot entered into Tzohar. Tzohar. And that Tzohar, it's after the place um, that it says small, but it also means sadness in Hebrew. You know, tsar, tsar. Same root as the word sadness. And here is what happens into Sodom. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, uh, brimstone and fire from the, from, from the Lord out of heaven. So, okay, it kept coming out of heaven. But the two men went to Sodom and said, they're going to do it. So how exactly it worked, we don't really fully understand, right? Here it explained that God does it directly from heaven. So why was there even a need of the two men to go there? Maybe to check how evil they are. But, you know, God never, there's no word of God sending them. You know, they were talking, the two men left. God stays there, speak with Abraham. They already know their mission. It couldn't be anything else but being really one. They are really one. They don't need to talk to one another. They are really one in that mission. God doesn't say, you go there. He said, I will go down and check what's happening. Remember? I will go down. And then without any further ado, any further words, the two men depart and they go and Abraham stands with God, the Lord, the Father, and they go and they already know their mission and no words are exchanged here. He doesn't ask them to go there. They go there. They say, we are, they're going to check. God says, I'm going to check. But they go there to check. They go to check if the city is really evil, and it's very evil. They got a demonstration right at the beginning. As soon as they arrive there, they get this demonstration how evil it is. And they say, they say to Lot, as we read before, oh, we are here to destroy the city. And then here we see in 20, verse 24 that God, the Father, does that, right? Then you have a hey. He is the one who is throwing, look at that, the yud hey vav hey. He's the one who's throwing that fire, you know, the brimstone and the fire from heaven down there. So they're all, you can't escape it to think that those three are working in concordance, in accordance with one another. They're connected. They don't need to speak to one another. They know their mission and they still are acting as a three. As, as three entities, that is really clear here. I mean, can, you can ask legally and legitimately, can God do this whole thing? We said, yes, he can, but we don't really know how it's constructed. So sometimes, you know, people are really trying to find out all the secrets and the mysteries of the high heaven. How did they really work? We don't know. You know, I remember one time I came to... <laughs> I don't know if that was in Oklahoma, where it was. I think it was in Oklahoma. There's a big uh, conference there, like a thousand people or more. And um, they all asked me, well, oh, yo, well, the Hebrew, you know. They, and I could see they're interested in the secrets. They want, People want to know secrets. And I don't know secrets. How do I know, you know? But when I came to speak, I said, well, today we're going, we're going to speak about the hidden. There is a hidden manual. It's called the Manual for God's Business. Wow, everybody, whoa, that's exciting. The manual for God's business. What a promise, you know, like exactly how it's working there in heaven. 
And I said, but unfortunately, I don't have that manual. Instead, we're going to use the manual for human business. It's called the Bible. Let's talk about the Bible. <laughs> you know, the manual for God's business is missing. We can infer and we can deduct from some verses. Like here, you know, a very good way. We know how it happened. We, we read the description. We believe the Bible. We know that it happened this way. But why three and why and who? I mean, we, we can see they don't need to talk and they're acting as one entity, as one single entity, yet there are three. And this is how we can leave that. You know, it's like believing. You can't really go scientifically and empirically like in science to test God. You can't, right? People try to do that in the past. They can't really test God. God can test us. We cannot test him. It's, it's, it's a failure, you know? I mean, look at Sarah. I mean, you can see, you can't not help, you can't help but laughing when she's lying to him. He already knew without her saying a word. He already knew that you're laughing and you're thinking you're old and God said the same word. And yet, how ridiculous is to go, to go and say, oh, I didn't do that. Oh, really? You know? Like you picture it like a child, you know? They do something, that you can, it's obvious and clear. I didn't do it, bro. Right? You did it, really? You know, I mean, who are you kidding here? You know, this is the demonstration of how we can't really um, do anything that God basically would not know if He wants to know, and we can't test Him. He can test us. We cannot test Him, and we can't lie. And we need to be kind of. It shows that it doesn't say it's infer it that it's in His hands. You know. Okay. So here is what he does. He turns away those cities and all the, you know, this whole area. And um, they really say there are some, even archaeologically, there is evidence, you know, that this area was very fruitful at the time. You know, the area of the Dead Sea. Now it's a desolate. For many years it's been desolate. But at that time, when Lot separated from Abraham, he went to a certain area there before, which is the area of Sedom, and that was very flourishing. If you go now to Sedom, I mean, I visited a few years ago, it's all desolate. There is nothing even growing there in that area. So here and there in, in the area, in the prairie there, you can find a certain kind of bush fighting for its life, but nothing really green. It's all brownie and maybe a little bit of... It's all dead until now. Um, but why did he go when they split the land before? It was in last week's Torah portion. Um, and he went there. Abraham went to another place. Both of them went to areas that are livable. And suddenly, now, after this, it's not, okay? So he, sp he spills um, brimstone. And um, um, so in Hebrew, the word is sulfur, you know, the brimstone. Sulfur and fire. Sulfur. That can burn the ground for a long time. It doesn't dissipate easily. Okay. So his wife, in 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. It's still there. There is something that they call the pillar, you know, and a lot of people that visit there tastes her. You can touch there and put uh, like that. Uh, and it is salty, but, you know, we don't know if it's legend. I mean, if that's the place there, what we see, it doesn't look like a person, of course. It's big. It's huge, you know. Um, Okay, and Abraham gets up in the morning to the place where we stood before the Lord, right? Al Pnei Elohim. And he looks at the whole area of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he see, this is very pictorial, and he sees steam and smoke coming out um, like in a furnace, you know, from the, from the face of the ground. Um, and, with, and, and as God is destroying those cities, and Abraham remembers... And God remembers Abraham, and he sends Lot from the, um, to the, the, area, the destruction area uh, where Lot said. Okay, and Lot came out from Zohar, you know, Zohar in Hebrew, but it's not Zohar, it's Zohar, T-Z, Zohar, and lived in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to live in, in, Zo in Zohar, and he lived in the cave and his two daughters with him. The rest of the part of the story is kind of disgusting, um, you know, what they try to do. But the message of this 
is two nations came out from this um, incest that is happening there, the two girls having that thing with their father. And, they, and this is what you see in, um, the first one is giving birth to a son, and his name is Moab, Moab. What is the English? It's Moab. But it's Moab in Hebrew, and this is the nation of enemies of Israel, Moab, right? And they are there in the mountains in the east of, of Israel. And he's the father of Moab until this very day. And the second one, the young one, also gave birth to a child, and they called him Ben Ami. Ben Ami sounds nice, the son of my, my people, but he's the father of Bnei Ammon, the Ammonite. Ammonite also was the, were the enemies of Israel. And that city of the Ammonites, until today, it's Amman in Jordan. You know, the capital of Jordan, Amman. This is where the Ammonites are in Jordan today. Okay? Um, but I don't know if the people there, the Jordanians are, in Jordan, uh, you won't say this are descendants of the Ammonites. I mean, 80 to 90% of the population there are Palestinians, and 10%, maybe 10 to 14% are Bedouin. They are both Muslims, Sunni Muslims that live there, not Shiite, but Sunni Muslims that live there, and they're very different. So the 10% of the Bedouin, you know, this is the, where the kingdom is from and all that, they're not Palestinian. They're very different, and uh, people that live there, they don't get the full rights. That's why they keep them in camps and all that. I mean, sometimes they issue them um, a passport so they can travel, but they're not, full, they're not fully citizens there, you know. They are in the parliament, but anyway, it's a different story. Uh, those are the Ammonites. Okay, and then in the chapter 20, Abraham travels from them to the land of the Negev, that's southern Israel, and he sits and he dwells between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourn in Grar. Not Gerar, but Grar. G-R-A-R should be. Okay. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, my sister, look at that. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. She is my sister. So he needs to say to her, he didn't say to her, right? And Abimelech, okay? So how did he jump here, this Abimelech, Abimelech suddenly? There's something, the sequence is kind of missing in the sentence, right? He goes and he lives there in Grar. Okay, very nice. And Abraham, and Abraham said to Sarah, said to Sarah, not off. In Hebrew, and Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, my sister. He calls her my sister. So the English is a little bit uh, confused here. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. What is she? He's talking to her. He doesn't say to her, she is. Okay. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. A little confused sentence here. You see, the structure of the English is not good. Um, okay, but basically he's calling her his sister. He's calling his wife his sister. Okay, and then in verse 3, and God say, came to Ab Abimelech, the king there. He think, well, if there's a sister, I can take her. You know, there's no, we don't need to be kind of uh, considerate. You can take the sister. And God came to Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, Behold, you, but a dead man, because the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Whoa. But, he, but Abraham said that he's his sister. Apparently he said it to the people of Abimelech, the Jesus sister, not to his wife, right? As the verse says in 2. In 4, in verse 4, and Abimelech had not come near her. Basically, had not, you know. And he said, um, and he said, Lord, will you slay also a righteous nation? So he, the king is the nation. Basically, if God would slay him, he would slay the whole nation there. And he puts the, argue, the, the answer for that. Said he not to me, she is my sister. Okay, here's the justification. He, did, he didn't say what? He didn't say um, she's a sister. I mean, he, Abraham said to him, she's my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. Okay, we didn't know that from the story, but we get the report here. In the, integrity, in the integrity of my heart and innocency, innocency, but only we, 
of my hands have I done this? All that is happening in a dream, right? All this conversation is in a dream. And God said to him in a, dr- in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. All right. So he took her, thought innocently that she is a, you know, um, because and apparently both of them lied. Abraham said she's my sister, and she said, oh, he's my brother. Okay. But the king, luckily, God stopped him from doing any extra action which cannot be reversed, right? All right. So how do we solve the issue? God says to him, and now therefore restore the man's, the man, his wife, give it back to her, for he's a prophet. Oh, and what if he wasn't a prophet? Then it's okay. He is a prophet. Well, don't do that. I mean, he's an important guy. You know, hey, for he's a, for he's a prophet, that's a reason? You know, but that's what it says, even in the Hebrew, for he's a prophet. And he shall pray for you. Okay, so you get a reward because he's a prophet. He can pray for you. If he's an ordinary one, maybe keeper. I don't know. No. All right. So kind of a strange justification here, you know. And he shall pray for you because he's a prophet. And you shall live. And if you restore her not, know you that you shall surely die you and, 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 and all who are yours. Well, obviously, what's the choice? That thing, hmm, shall I keep her? Don't die, me and everything, or return her and get me blessed? Hmm, okay. So every man, this is all in a dream, right? Very difficult dilemma, kind of. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them these things, in their ears, and they and the men were very afraid. And Abimelech calls Abraham and said to him, "What did you do to us? And wh- how how did I sin to you that you brought to me and to my kingdom such a great punishment um, for things that uh, you did very? I mean, the English here, uh, my kingdom, you have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. True. And Abimelech said to Abraham." And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Now, why would they do that? He thought, Well, there, there's no fear of God here. I mean, if they want to, you know, King David did that too. You know, he took her, but she was husband. Then he sent him to die, and he took the wife, right? So here they can make it more simple. Kill the guy and take the wife, right? So I I thought, I was afraid that you're going to do that, and you'll do. But still, it puts him still as a liar, and that's a problem, and the Bible will resolve it in a second. Um, And yet, indeed, she is my sister. Woo! So she is your sister? Now, Pastor Mark really explained it in details, right? Last week and the week before, I heard that. It was like really a great explanation with the chart of the entire family there. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. All right. So, in a way, you can get away with that. You can say my sister, right? It's, it's, but she's his wife, and she became my wife. So he explained it. He's a sister but wife, and, you know, sister and not sister at the same time. I didn't lie. You can get away with that. I don't know in the court today you can get away with that, but he did get away with that here, there. Um, and, um, and it came to pass when God caused, uh, caused me to wander from my father's house, then I said to her, this is your kingdom, this is your uh, kindness, um, which you shall show to me at every place where we shall come, say to me, he is my brother. So he's instructing her to say, oh, he's my brother. So apparently she did say that, right? So Abimelech takes uh, cattle and sheep and oxen and... um, all men servants and serve, s- slaves and women servants 
and gave them to Abraham and returned to him uh, Sarah his wife. And Avimelech says, Behold, my land is before you. Live there if it pleases you. It please, if it pleases you. Okay. So I gave money and all that. Okay, so Abraham is now the result. In 17, Abraham prays to God, and God heals Abimelech and his wife and his um, uh, maidservants, and they bore children. So apparently there was a punishment here that could not have children during that time until Abraham forgave him and uh, God forgave him, right? And the explanation, for the Lord has closed up all wombs of the house of Abimelech because Sarah, because Sarah, Abraham's wife. All right, issue resolved, right? Kind of strange issue, but it's been resolved. That leads us to um, chapter 21. And uh, God, this is just biblical description. Uh, what? 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 It's time? No way. Really? Oh, wow. I didn't finish that. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. To Daraba. Thank you. Mm, okay. Thank you for listening. Shalom. Let's go now to the back of your uh, chapters. And we can go to... Genesis 21. Take a look at Genesis 21 in your sheets there. Okay. Verse 1, and uh, it's all, this whole chapter of 21 is just to prepare to the dramatic events that are happening in chapter 22, which is a very dramatic um, chapter and also introduces a very important principle that appears more than once in the Bible. Last week, Pastor Mark was teaching the uh, Torah portion of Lech Lecha. And it, in, you know, that Lech Lecha in, included the principle what we, which we call the make no mistake. Because God says to him, and when he put a very important and very severe, very difficult mission in front of a human being, God understands it's a very difficult thing to do, to follow. And that's why he makes no room for mistakes or misinterpretation of his intention from the person. In that case, Abraham, and today we'll have it too. At that last week, he said to him, Go away, lech lecha, me'artzecha, from your land, mimoladetcha, from your homeland. Well, we got it, right? Go away. From your land, well, I, we know. I mean, that's it. No, should be enough, right? No. Lech lecha me'artzecha, from your country. Mimoladetcha, from your birthplace. Okay. Mibet avicha, from the house of your father. Make no mistake. Triple the declaration, which is really the same, to the land that I will show you. Very difficult. Abraham is a very old man, and he's asking him, I will pick up your stuff, and you're going to live in another place. Think of that you know, in an older age to wrap up everything and go to another land. You know, it's very difficult. Even if you go to a vacation in a strange place, it's difficult to understand what's going on and how people behave. And that's what he's asking him. And that's why he pays to make no mistake in Lech Lecha, which is the Torah portion of last week. We're going to see it here today again, even more severe than last time. Look at this. Now, to prepare for that event to take place, we see in verse 21, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had spoken. And he had spoken before, you will see that before, when he, he told her, in a year later, an appointed time, you will have a child. And she was laughing. Okay. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which... God has spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who is born to him. Look at this explicit language. Okay? And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him. Why do we have this duplicate? Isn't son is somebody who is born to you? I mean, why would we see that duplication happening also in the first part? Um, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac, Again, make no mistake. Look at that, three times. Okay? Name of his son. Obviously, this is the one that Sarah gave. 
the one who is born to him. All right, we got it. Whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. He called him Isaac. Three times mentioning and stressing what, where, what possible mistake could be here that that needed to be stressed so clearly. All right. Um, Vayamal, and Abraham circumcised his, uh, his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. Look at that. Not laugh at me, but laugh with me. Is that laughing with her? No, she's thinking the other way, right? Because when God told her in the chapters what you have, that we skipped, um, that he will, she will bear a child, she will bore a child, she was laughing inside her, not out loud and not saying anything, but thinking, oh, how could it be that I'll have pleasures, as the Bible says, or I'll have rejuvenation at my old age? How could it be? And God says to her, why did you laugh? But she didn't laugh out loud, right? She did it in her, in inside, as we saw it before. Um, and, and, and he said, no, you're laughing. And she said, I did not. I mean, who, how, who are you trying to really cheat here? He reads your heart. He knows what's inside you. And it was kind of a ridiculous situation that the person, she can see that God already knows that she's laughing, right? And he says to her, and he also says her thoughts. And she says, oh, I didn't laugh. Okay, so, but here is change. And he says, laugh with me. What is laugh with me? In Hebrew, it says, well, laugh at me. Not with me. Laughed at me, which makes sense, right? They will laugh at me, not with me. When you're laughing with someone, when he tells a nice joke or he does something really nice and you're laughing with, like, togetherness, no. It's laughing at her, not with her. Mistake in English, right? Um, it's actually anyone who will hear it will make fun of me, will laugh at me. And she said in verse 7, and she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah should suckle children? For I have born, born him a son in his old age. Okay. And the child, and the child grew and was the wind, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And um, here is a conflict. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, Hagar, it's Hagar in English, right? Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. Okay? Mocking her. But Omer Abraham. The son, the son of uh, Hagar is mocking her, right? Um, or mocking, mocking, uh, I, you know. And, and she said to Abraham, and she said to Abraham, cast out this slave and her son, for the son of this slave shall not be heir uh, with my son, with Isaac. What well, jealousy and also anger, she's being laughed at. And Abraham was not happy with it at all. And, and uh, the thing was very grievous in, Abraham, in Abraham's sight because of his son. All right? And God said to Abraham, let it not be grievous in your sight because of the, of the lad um, and because of your slave. In all that Sarah had said to you, listen to her voice. For Isaac shall your seed be with I, for in Isaac shall your seed be called. Okay, what would have happened if there was another child there? Is that a competition? She was the real wife. The other one was kind of a concubine or some kind of a she even called slave, right? Look at that. The word is slave. So uh, legally, anybody, even if that son would not be really one with the full rights of the son that is heir, right? Abraham was very rich, remember? So it, it means a lot of property also being given to the heir. But he puts Isaac first and he says to him, and also, and also of the son of the slave 
will I make a nation, but here is a compensation. Okay, God said, well, go ahead, listen to your wife. A very good point. Listen to her voice. Listen to what she's saying. But he's not allowing this, being, this, this child and the mother being casted away. is not just a punishment. And, and, and also of the son of the slave, will I make a nation because he's your seed. So they'll go to a nation. This is the promise of the Ishmaelites, of the Arabs today, basically. Okay? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Okay, so this is wilderness. He's sending her to the desert, right? It's kind of rough. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the uh, shrubs. And she went, and she went, uh, well, I'll do the team. She went to a certain distance and she said, I'm not going to see the death of the child. And she sat in front of him and she was raising her voice in, in, in crying. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, okay, he said to her, don't be afraid, Hagar. Don't be afraid. That's what it says, okay? Um, because Fear not, because God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Ra- arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Once again, the promise of becoming a great nation from a child that otherwise will be dying there. So God protects. He promises. Abraham sends her. The desert looks like there's no chance to survive. Angel of God comes with the, with the order. No, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll make him alive. And, uh, and she opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water that wasn't there probably a minute ago. And she went and filled out the bottle of water and gave it to the lad to drink. And, the, and, the, and God was with the lad. Okay, he was with him. And he grew and lived in the wilderness and became an archer. And he sat in the desert of Paran, of Paran, and his mother took him a wife from the land of Egypt. Well, the mother was Egyptian too, Hagar. And she takes him, another woman, that is, she's also Egyptian. So he's two-thirds Egyptian. Abraham was not Egyptian, right? The father. And it was, came to pass at that time, that Abimelech uh, and Pichol, and Pichol his name actually, and Pichol, um, the minister of his, uh, captain of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now swear to me, now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my grandson, okay? And, but according to the kindness that I have done for you, you shall do to me and to the land where you have sojourned. Now, this is the one who speaks here, right? Abimelech, right? And that's the one that almost took his wife and all that story that you'll see later on. And Abraham says, well, I am swear, I swear. Okay. And, um, and Abraham um, re- reproved Abimelech because, uh, because of all, because of the a well of water, which Abimelech's servant had uh, violently took away. All right. All right, so they make a deal between them. They make a covenant between them. And there are sheep there. Seven sheep is left there. I'm skipping quickly to get to the important part. And um, they make the, okay, there is a well. And he calls the place Beersheba. Beersheba means the, the, well, the well of the seven. That's what the meaning of the name Beersheba, which is a big city today in Israel, the third size city in Israel. And he called the place Beersheba because both of them, uh, okay, Sheva is seven, but it also means to swear. Not to curse, but to swear, okay, swearing. So because, and it says the reason for the Be'er Sheva name is because both of them were swearing there. Shava, okay, Be'er Shava, it says. And they make a covenant, and the Pichol, and Pichol, 
um, it's called Pichol, but Pichol in Hebrew, and the minister of his um, uh, army, or the captain of his army, came back, went back to the land of the Philistines. So they are Philistines. And Abraham um, planted a, a, a grove in Beersheba, and he called the name El Olam, called the name the, the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham lived in the land of the Philistines many days. Now, the land of the Philistines is in the south. Gaza, today, that was the capital. That was the center of the land of the Philistines. Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gat, that area, those are the Philistine, Philistine area. Now, we are going to the important, very strong uh, point. So... In, in chapter 22, this is the key uh, chapter to understand many things. Remember in Lech Lecha that we mentioned, that the pastor was teaching last week, he did a triple thing. Go away from your country, well, me, from your homeland, from the house of your father to the land I will show you. It's a, tri it's, a triple, um, it, it's a triple make no mistake statement. But here it goes even further than that. So he has a son that was born, born with very much difficulty, right? I mean, Abraham was very, against all odds, he was born. He was very, the father was very old. The mother was very old, yet God promised him, and he kept the promise, and a child is born to Abraham. What's the chances that it will happen again? I mean, it was very low chance even to happen in the first place. And everything goes with from the beginning. From the beginning, Abraham is promised by God, your children will be, become a great nation and you'll inherit the land and all that. Well, what we call promises, 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 right? Lots of promises. And look what happens here. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. So he tells us in the very beginning, it's a test. He did not really mean that, right? What's going on? And said to him, Abraham, and, and he said, Behold, here I am. Okay? And now he gives him the very, very complex mission, difficult, almost impossible mission to, in this situation. And he said to him in English, <laughs> very false word here. It says, Take now your son. That sounds very harsh. The, the now does not even appear in Hebrew. Take now your son. Okay, it's a very harsh demand, but now makes it even more, you know. But it's never appearing in the Hebrew. There's no such thing as take, take now your son, you know. This harsh statement in Hebrew is this. Kach na. You hear the, the similarity between na and now. But there is zero connection between na and now. When he says to him in Hebrew, kach na means in Hebrew, please take. Not now, please. The word na in Hebrew means please. A whole huge difference between the statement that may sound that God is very harsh and heartless. Now take your son. And here it says, please take your son. God is asking using the word please to a man, please take your son. Na is please. Think of that. He knows what a difficult thing he's going to ask him, and he uses the word please. And the word please here is used as a softening. Uh, it has a softening effect, like laying a hand on Abraham's shoulder and telling him, trust me, please do that. Do that for me, right? You see that point here? The heart of God is revealed in the Hebrew, and it's not revealed at all in the English. The English kept it like a very harsh statement. Now, take your son, blah, blah, blah. And the Hebrew, please, take your son. Do you see the huge difference between the two? I see you nodding your head. You do. Okay, but still, he doesn't want to be fooled. He has, a, God, has a very clear, specific a statement and mission to, to, to Abraham. And he says, Please take your son, but make no mistake, et yechitcha, your only one. Well, he has only one anyway, right? The other one is gone already, right? 
your only one, and that's the only legal son that he has anyway. But it's not enough. It's only a twofold, make no mistake. The one that you love, well, we got it. Take your son, the only one, the one that you love. And if that's not enough, he's saying it name. Take Isaac. Fourfold, make no mistake. Take your son, the only one, the one that you love. Take Isaac. Look at that. You can't really escape that kind of demand, right? You can't put another one and say, oh, that's the one. No, that's not the one you love. Oh, that's not the one, your only one. That's not Isaac. Can't escape that. It's, make, it's a fourfold, make no mistake statement. And go to the land and lech lecha. Now look at that. This is the, exactly the same words that are the name of the, of the Torah chapter, of the Torah portion of last week. Now what, I don't know if Pastor explained it this way, but lech lecha, again, remember we spoke about that it's a very harsh demand of a person to leave everything, pack up everything in an old age and go to another place. Very tough, right? So why is lech lecha? The word is spelled the same, lech lecha. Lecha means to yourself. Again, it's kind of a soothing um, repetition. Just like the word na, please take your son. Lech lecha, go there. Also, like laying a hand on his shoulder, go to yourself. You know, it's like softening, soothing the demand and the request by saying lech lecha. Even if you say to a person lech, it's enough. It means go. What's the English says here? And go. You see, the English does not have the nuance of lech lecha. Lech lecha is almost like adding, please go. Trust me, I'm sending you. But now what he says to him in this verse, in two. And he said that he is God, right? Take now your son. Take now your son. Harsh, wrong. The only son, the, your only son, Isaac, who, whom you love. Okay, they changed the order of that. And go to the land of Moriah. And offer him there for the burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Wow. Now think of Abraham getting in that age, having all these promises that to, he will inherit the land and, you know, will have all that. And suddenly uh, God is telling him, no, what, what I want you to do is take this boy and sacrifice him. Very harsh, right? Sounds very harsh. Okay. But he wakes up early in the morning, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and settled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son <clears throat> and broke the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God has told him. So he goes to one of those mountains. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far away from a distance, right? He did see the place. That now Mount Moriah, Moriah, you know, this is the very important place in Jerusalem, Hara Moriah. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here. What what happened? And yeah, Abraham said to his young men, these are two servants that are there. Stay here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder, right? Go further and worship and come back to you. So again, he's not telling them the truth, right? He knows that he's not going to do that. He knows that his purpose is to sacrifice his son. But he's not telling them the truth once again, like he did before with Abimelech. You will see that in the second session. He's telling them, oh, we're going to praise and, and to worship and we'll come back to you. But he doesn't really mean that. He knows that that's not his mission. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Now, Pastor Mark really explains it in a fascinating way. How He asked the question, how old do you think Isaac was when that happened? Well, he was not a little lad. He was not a young boy. According to what Pastor said, he was around, what did he say, 30? So around 30 years of age. You feel like, okay, it's an innocent boy, doesn't know what he's going to do. No, this is an adult, you know. 
He knows very well what's happening to him. Okay? So they go together. But maybe he knows, because by the, by the chapter here, we don't know it for sure, you know? Um, so they go together, and Isaac says to Abraham, his father, and he says, my father, and he said, here am I, son, my son, and he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, I mean, we're here, everything is there, but we're going to sacrifice. Where is the lamb? What, what are you going to sacrifice? And Abraham, and this is like the cause of a one word that became a name for God that people are using, but in a very false, very distorted way in English. And God said to him, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the word is Adonai or Elohim Yireh Lo. Yireh is translated in English in many times to Jaira. You heard that name before, the Lord Jaira? Yeah, completely false distortion of the word Yireh. There's no gyra and there's no gyroscopes involved here. Nothing to do with navigation. The J, the J does not even exist in Hebrew. So the whole word is year A. will show. That's it. No gyra, you know. God will show. It's, the word should be year A. But you see what happens when there are misunderstanding and lack of knowledge. They'll make up all kinds of names and stuff. Like, you know, the one in, uh, in near the Sea of God, Copernum. What is this Copernum nonsense? What Copernum? You know, it's the two Hebrew words, Kfar, which means the village, of Nahum, that's Nahum, the prophet. So this Copernum is the Kfar Nahum, the village of Nahum. Just simple words, and, and they distort them completely, and they make up like, well, that's the Greek adding. So with all due respect to Greek, you need to go and focus your understanding on Hebrew and not on Greek and not on Roman or Latin or anything. So just remember, no gyra. The gyra is year A. means will show. That's all what it says here, you know. God will provide himself a lamb. God, your elo. Your elo actually means will show, not just provide himself. Your elo will show, okay? Show himself. Okay. And they came to the place, uh, verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. Yep. And bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar. Now, where is Isaac say in this whole thing? Doesn't he try to argue? You know, say, hey, what are you doing? I mean, in 30 years old, he's probably stronger, much stronger than his father, right? He could simply get away. But we don't know much about the faith of Isaac at this point, right? We know the faith of Abraham that follows what God tells him. But why is Isaac agreeing to this whole thing? He didn't know anything about what's going to happen, right? Mystery. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, many people came up with this question, this moral issue. I mean, we are raised with principles in life, right? And, the, and our offsprings are very important. They continue us. And I mean, is it something that you can ask the person to go and kill his son for just showing? I mean, does God need that sacrifice? No. Well, think, think of this. People sacrifice all kind of uh, animals, right? No, does God really need those animals? I mean, what? It's a personification when they say, uh, they, in the uh, other parts of the Old Testament, you know, raising, I mean, uh, burning uh, the, uh, the, the, the calves and all that, and God smells it mm, and enjoys it. Like you're going to near a steakhouse and you're smelling those black angles. So, you know what? What is the story here? I mean, God needs to enjoy. This whole idea of the korban, the sacrifice, is a very strange one anyway to start with. And duly so, it was canceled, you know? No more of that. And when they say we are got away with the law, you know, this is the big thing of the church. Like, we're not under the law. 
the main intention of that statement were not under the law or may, more, mainly the sacrifice, but not the other law. What is the other law? Respect your father and your mother. No, we're going to now shoot them or kick them or spit at them every morning we see them. And then it says you should not kill. No, everybody should kill somebody two or three for breakfast or before breakfast, you know. And you should not uh, steal. No, we're going to steal everything from everyone. And you should not, I mean... <laughs> What is wrong in the commandments? What is wrong in the law? Why do we hear this strange undertone throughout generations in all those many churches in the world? Oh, the law. <laughs> you know, spooky law. Woo. No, the law is fine. Nobody is free from the, that law. Nobody, you know? And this is the lie to say that we are free from all the laws. So what do they do when you're not comfortable? You're including everything. You're spilling the baby along with the water, right? No, the law of sacrifices is done with. That's true. It should not, you know, I shouldn't say that it should not be there in the first place, but it's kind of thing like God makes them. He loves all his creatures. And all. How does that live along with its theory that God loves all his creatures and he, he mercies everyone, the birds, and then, and then at the same time, oh, go ahead and kill those animals and bow, and he can smell them. He can't even eat them, you know? So he just smelled them and he's very enjoying that. Idea was like, okay, it's yours and it's property and you're giving it to God. That's the sacrifice. All right, here is the word for you, and it's very important. People call what the Nazis did, you know, to the Jewish people in World War II, they call it wrongfully Holocaust. They call it, it's a wrong term to call Holocaust. Holocaust in Greek is the translation of korban nirtse in Hebrew, which means a desired sacrifice that God wants. These are the animals. So when he desires a sacrifice, that is the holocaustos in Greek. Holocaustos is something that God desired at the time. He desired those sacrifices. So that's not the word to call what happened to the Jews there, because otherwise you're putting God as one who desired that to happen. So the word there is a biblical word. You'll find it in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, other places. The word is shoah. Nobody uses in Israel the word holocaust. They use the word shoah. And the, and the translation is wrong and false. Just remember that. It's wrong and false to say Holocaust to what happened there. Once again, wrong and false. That what happened there is a complete huge disaster in magnitude. And that's the, the word for that is Shoah and not Holocaust. So uh, he puts him there and he takes the knife to, in order to, to, to slay him. And he said that we had to put the green. You see the green? Because this is in the Mark Bills Bible. Okay? Uh, not everything in these sheets that you receive today has. But you'll see in the beginning, when you follow the second session, you'll see a lot more uh, words in green. One of them is really shocking. You know, I can show it to you now, but then you'll hear it again because it need, really needs to sink into the brain. Um, we put the green where the word's supposed to be. And this is not rewriting the Bible or doing all kind of uh, thing. No, in the Mark Bills Bible, Pastor Mark, and with my little Hebrew help, we're putting the word as it should be, as it is in Hebrew. But you, when you're reading it in English, you're getting the true story and not a distorted one. And you know what? We're not going to stop here. Let's go back and let me show you a distortion, okay? Let me show you a distortion. Go to page... Um, I'm skipping because you'll hear it again in the recording later but let's go back to where I'm sending you now okay um, Genesis it's still in 18 right Genesis 18 it's the third page fourth page fourth sheet that you have Genesis 19 sorry ver Genesis 19 verse 18 it look at the key mistake in English. You'll see it again, and it's not enough to show it once or twice. You need to see it many times and see how things can be distorted. Genesis 18, I mean Genesis 19, verse 18, says the, the, the red words are in plural, right? The yellow, I mean the yellow, the, the blue 
are for singular. This is the detective job you'll do later on in the second session. But look at verse 18. And Lot said to them, you see the word them? Oh, not so, my, and what do you think your 99.9% .9 of English Bible to say? Lord, in singular. So how can he say to them, Lord, right? How is it possible to say to them, Lord? So, and Lot said to them, oh my, and here, the Lord that you see here, it's a correction that will be only in Mark Bill's Bible. You'll not find it in any other Bible. This is in the transliterated phonetic, audio phonetic translator, I mean, uh, Mark Bill's Bible. All right, let's go back to the back. And we have a little time. Okay, so we go to where we were. Okay, uh, chapter 22. And verse 11, right? And the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Avraham, Avraham. And he said, here am I. Hineni, in one word, here am I. Three words in Hebrew, hineni. Say it once, hineni. This is the word of readiness in Hebrew, and when the you'll see it later on when you get to the prophets, when you study prophets, um, prophets, and you'll see when the, God calls his prophet to a mission, he says, like to Isaiah, and the prophet answers, hineni. Here I am. I'm ready for the mission. Hineni. You know, the song of Leonard, Leonard Cohen, who died recently, he is saying, hey, nanny, Lord, here I am, Lord, I'm ready. You know, that is the, um, I, I heard it, in, he sang it in Hebrew. But Hineni is the word that every prophet would say, and God calls Abraham prophet. He already said to Abimelech that he's a prophet. So it's not just here I am, it's not just a location, an expression of location, geographical or position location, but it's also an expression of readiness. Remember, hineni is an expression of readiness. Here I am, i.e. I'm ready to hear whatever you say and ready to follow whatever you say. That's the hineni, more than just here I am. Okay, I didn't look, God didn't say, oh, I don't see you, where are you are? Okay, here I am, no. It's much more than that. It's call for attention and readiness to follow. That's the idea. So he says, Hineni, here I am. And then he gives him the command. And, say, and he said, we put he in green because that's not what the English is there in the New Testament. And he said, what does it say in the English? I don't know um, when you look. There was a reason we put the he here. Okay, maybe it's missing. Vayomer. Yeah, it has to be because Vayomer means already in that word means he said. Um, Lay not your hand upon the lad, nor do anything to him, for now I will know that you fear God, seeing that you did not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Okay. Vaisa Avonametinav, you see the word Yisa appears, and I, I talked to it about, about that in the recording that you'll hear later on. Yisa is to lift up, to lift up. It appears also in the reference to prayer and to um, saying the name of God. Saying the name of God, you cannot do that expression in Hebrew. It's lifting up the name of God. Nasa Shem Adonai. And Nasa Tfila, lifting up a prayer. And here he lift up his eyes, and he see. And behold, and looked up, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the in the uh, in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went to took the ram, and offered him up for the burnt offering in the pla in place of his son. And Abraham called this place, called the name of that place Adonai Yir E. This is the gyra that you see in many English Bibles, right? That's the gyra. But Adonai Yir E means God will show or God will see. Both of them are correct in that case. Adonai Yir E means literally God will see, but it, it will, as it said to this day, the mound of the Lord, it shall be seen. Okay. In the mount of the Lord, it will be seen. 
And the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, called to Abraham for the heaven the second time. He calls him again and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord. See, the angel of God is like the Lord. It's the same thing in that case, right? The angel speaks for the Lord, right? Because he does say, the angel of God calls him, and the angel said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord. Okay, same thing. For because you have done this thing and have not withhold your son, your only son, ki berach avarecha, okay, um, so th- that, that uh, here is the blessing. That I'll bless. I will bless you with multipl- uh, multiplying. I will multiply your seed as the stars in the heaven and and uh, and the sand which is upon the seashore. And you seed shall um, possess the the gates of the enemies. Okay, uh, and this is the rest of the blessing. Okay, and uh, your the seeds that be you know. Uh, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Abraham returned to his young men, those two that are waiting for both of them to come, and they see them come. And they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived in Beersheba. So for them, the whole thing was like a non-existing event. They, he told them, uh, just we sit here, we'll come back. And they came back. So, okay, let's go. You know, for them, they never experienced any of this dramatic experience that Abraham and Isaac felt, right? Okay, so he goes back to Beersheba, and it was after this, after these things, and uh, Milka uh, gave birth also to children to Nahor, his Abraham brothers, and that was Uts. They call it Oz, no? Uts. No, it is Uts. Uts, his firstborn. That's the, by the way, the king of Oz, when they called it that, you know, it's Uts. That's the name, Uts in Hebrew. means a consul, to give a consul, to consult. Bechoro and Booz. The Booz is a really bad name. Booz means boo in Hebrew. And uh, Kemuel, the father of Aram, and other names, Pildash and Betuel, and that's, that's it. Those are names. There's no point to repeat them because you will not remember anyway. All right. So I think our time is up here, and take a break. When you come back, you will follow instructions that you will do this detective job, and you'll see how the language flips, and you use Hebrew, because you have to do with your eyes, check between the Hebrew, the, between the, the red and the blue. And it goes step by step, and it has also... Uh, jumping right from uh, to keep the continuity it will go and you'll skip some verses but it will show you that the story needs to go by a timeline and that's what you do. You follow the timeline with the Hebrew. Todah for listening to me and shalom shalom to all of you. Shalom. Todah.